Um, well, please join me in welcoming General Mary Kay Eater. Thank you very much. I'm really thrilled to be here tonight and be able to talk to you about some people I've gotten to know so well over the last few years. Can you all hear me? Because I can't tell. <clears throat> this started when I was asked to speak at an Army event on leadership. I, I was a substitute. The main, the main speaker had dropped out, so I had two weeks to get ready. You know, that's usually how good things happen, right? You know, you're kind of the substitute at the last minute. And so I had been reading some stories about members of the greatest generation who continue to pass in large numbers from this earth. And so I had a couple of these stories about things they had done, and I used them to talk about. And then I kept finding more stories, but I didn't know what I was going to do with them, so I saved them. And by 2019, I had a pretty large folder of great stories. Anybody watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? So in 2019, Alex Borstein <clears throat> stood up to receive the Emmy for Best Supporting Actress. And she said, in World War II, my grandmother was about to be shot into a pit. And she turned to the guard and said, what happens if I step out of line? And he said, well, I don't have the heart to shoot you, but somebody will. She stepped out of line. And for that, I am here today. And for that, my children are here today. So step out of line, ladies. Step out of line. And that's where this came from. Now, we don't have a clicker, so watch me run around and come back to the computer every few minutes here. And this is the first story I found. This is Hilda Eisen. Hilda grew up about 80 miles southwest of Warsaw, Poland. At the age of 19, she was married, her first husband, David. And that's when the Nazis invaded. And her little town, Izbica, was overrun. Her entire family, most of their community was taken. And they ended up in a ghetto in Lublin. This is a picture from that ghetto. Hilda and her husband, David, escaped. They went on the run. They stayed ahead of the Nazi patrols for about two weeks before they were captured. And then they, too, ended up in that ghetto. They escaped. She, she went to the guard one day and said, you know, I need to go out, do a little shopping. I'll be right back. And he said, not a problem. Opened the gate, and away they went to the forest, where they spent the next four years with other insurrectionists, if you will, and they fought the Nazis. We come to the end of the war. David has been killed. She goes back to her little town, and she meets four other young people there who ha are returning from whatever terrible things they have been through, and one of them is Harry Eisen. She remembers Harry from junior high. She didn't like him much then, but he looks pretty good now. So these four young people decide they will go forward together. And they head down towards Munich, where they spend the next two years in a displaced persons camp. You know, at the end of the war, we think everybody goes back home, they go back to normal. For millions, that didn't happen right away. Two years they spend in this camp, where there's not much food, there's no jobs, there's nothing much to do, so she finds a cousin a distant cousin in California to sponsor them, and they moved to the U.S., to California. <clears throat> Harry gets a job in a hot dog factory. It's the only job he can get because they don't speak English. But they have their first house, and by 1948, at Christmas time, there's a knock on the door. A knock on the door brings it all back. All the fear, all the worry, all of the what is this? Is it happening again? So they don't answer the door. They look out through the curtains, and they wait till they see people leave. Then they open the door and discover their new neighbors have bought Christmas presents for the baby. So to me, that's the moment they realized, finally, they could go on, that this was different. So they saved their money. They bought about eight chickens. Hilda would box them up, and Harry would sell them off the back of his bicycle. Now, this picture of them in the lower right or left, depending on where you are, is of their grandson's bar mitzvah in 1996. 
by the time they sold their chicken business in 2002, it was Norco Farms, if anybody's heard of Norco Farms in California, the largest egg producing business west of the Mississippi in the United States. They had 450 employees, 800,000 chickens, and an annual income of 110 million. You talk about coming from nothing and going forward with all of the escaping they had to do and then the will to drive ahead. I was so taken with this story. <clears throat> but I kept finding more. Now I found quite a few about people who fought in the resistance in different countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, but I'm especially taken with the story of these two sisters from England. <clears throat> this is Ida and Louise Cook, middle-aged public servants who worked for the government in London as clerks. And in the mid-1920s they decided I want to go see an opera. I do too. Well, let's, let's save our money and go see an opera. So they go to Covent Garden, and then they're hooked. They made their own clothes, as you can probably tell, and they became groupies. They were obnoxious groupies. <laughs> they would hang out at the stage door trying to get autographs, and eventually they became part of the opera community. They got to know the singers, the, the symphony conductors, and they became friends. And come into the 1930s, and as they're going to operas on the continent, whether it's in Berlin or Munich or Vienna, one of the symphony conductors said, would you take one of my friends and escort her back to London? And they said, well, sure, we'd be glad to. They didn't realize they were helping someone escape. But once they did, they continued to do this. They would go into Germany to see an opera dressed in their dowdy clothes not wearing any jewelry or watches and they would come back decked out in jewels and with new friends every time because you had to have the means to show you could support yourself to get admitted into the UK but you couldn't do it any other way with money you had to have hard goods so here comes Ida wearing this gigantic diamond brooch on the train and they weren't afraid of being caught. They had, as Ida said, great faith in their British passports. And they came close a number of times. But when you think about the time period where so many people said, what can I do? What can one person do? How can I make a difference? They found a way. Did they save the whole world? No, but they saved 26 families from certain death. <clears throat> and how did they fund this? They did go to churches. They did try to raise money and find sponsors. But they had another way to raise money. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ida, for a number of years, between 1935 and 1986, wrote 130 romance novels <laughs> under the name Mary Burchell. This is one I found, The Girl in the Blue Dress, on Amazon, or maybe it was eBay. 1947, it was originally cost 45 cents. So this was a big uptick, and it cost me much more than that. But a lot of these books are what helped her get the money to bring people out. Later, she was president of the British Romance Novelist Association. Um, and I have their 50th anniversary book in which she is described as being just loopy enough to be interesting. <laughs> they were both recognized. Uh, numerous times after the war as righteous among nations in Israel. They were recognized by the British government. But whenever that happened, they were both so modest. And one of the things Ida would say is, we were just lucky enough to see the problem in terms we could understand and know what we could do with it. But there's also a number of military people I found. And I was surprised at some of these stories too because I kept thinking, all these years I've been in the Army, I should know some of this stuff. And I don't. Why don't I? Well, because we don't talk about some of these stories. Or maybe they weren't um, part of the mainstream at the time. And certainly for people who were in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, no one talked about that until 2008 when the files were declassified. <clears throat> and that's how I found the story of Stephanie Czech. Stephanie's parents immigrated from Poland. 
She didn't speak English till she started grade school. And in 1943, she graduated from college. She's in New York. She can't find a job, so she's working for an oil company as a clerk, and quite annoyed about that, I might add. So she decide, decides to join what is then the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, later the WAC, and is sent to Fort Des Moines, Iowa. This is not a garden spot. And, and what she does there is work in basic training. Anybody here Army veteran? Who will admit it? Okay. <laughs> if you work in basic training, it's repetitive. It's the same thing every six to eight weeks. You teach them how to march, how to say yes sir, no ma'am. Then you send them on their way and you get a new group. She wanted a bigger challenge. And one of her friends said, well apply to the OSS. You have the language skills. So she became a counterintelligence agent. Now, that was pretty risky at the time. Later, much later after the book came out, I found a video interview she did about 20 years ago in which she talked about her first assignment, which was traveling around France and Germany doing reports, this is in May, June 1945, about Nazi infiltrators trying to get into the general population, um, rise of communism, and then for, she had her first real assignment. She was sent to Poland. But she'd already met her husband, Bill, Bill Rader. Bill was one of the 350,000 men in England as pilots. Bill was a bomber pilot. Now, when she was assigned on that first assignment, she was assigned to the London headquarters. There were 30 women to 350,000 men. She liked those odds. So she met Bill on a blind date, <clears throat> but he had to wait two weeks until her calendar was free enough for her to go out with him. So she had been out on a date the night before she went out with him, walking down the street in London. He saw her. He knew, he knew who she was. And for years after they got married, he would tell their friends he picked her up off the streets of London. <laughs> I found her story after she passed away in 2017. She had never received an award for what she did. And what she did undercover in Poland, in Warsaw, in September, October, through January 1946, was extremely dangerous. And she was almost caught by the Russians. There were people taken off the streets daily who disappeared. There was nothing about anything she had with her that said what her true identity was. She was a Polish civilian, for all they knew. So she did her reports. And there are those in our government who said, we will never know how much she contributed. So at her funeral at Arlington in 2017, she was presented with the Legion of Merit. Let me tell you about somebody else who was in her class, her WAC class. And that's Charity Adams Early. Now Charity joined up about the same time Stephanie did, and they were both there at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. <clears throat> Charity had graduated from college and was working on her master's at Ohio State when she decided to join. She too had to work in basic training and she too was bored with it. Now when I started to write this book, it was in January of 2000. What happens in February? The whole world shuts down and I can no longer do any research, no one will answer my calls. I can't get into any library, any museum, so I started buying books online. <clears throat> so I have quite a few that, you know, libraries have yard sales, right? So I do have Charity Adams' autobiography written in 1948 that at one time was the property of the Sioux City, Li Iowa Library. <clears throat> and she talks quite a bit about how she was preparing herself for greater challenges. You know, they say never volunteer. She volunteered for everything there was. She taught herself logistics, how to manage a dining facility, how to understand military law and military justice. She did everything she could to be ready for greater command. So finally, in December of 1944, she's given the opportunity to command. She's told, don't open the envelope. You're on a plane. You're going to go to London. You'll find out where you're going. Once you're over the water, you can open the envelope. 
She looks down, there's the Chesapeake Bay, that's close enough. She opens the envelope and discovers she's going to be the commander of the brand new 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. She's gonna fix the problem with the mail. So because of the pace of operations in Europe, the mail had been delayed for up to two years. So some people hadn't gotten anything from home in that amount of time. And if you read stories about units preparing to deploy in World War II, some of them trained together for up to two years before they went. She met the people in her unit when they got off the ship in Scotland. Now we see more pictures of some of this because they were asked to do a parade in Birmingham, England. So they did a pass and review parade. The commander of the communications zone where she was stationed said, so Charity, can your troops march? She had no idea. She said, oh yes sir, they can march very well. So they had this parade. But then it was time to go to work. So she takes them to the hangars, hangars, warehouses, where this mail had been stored. You can imagine after two years, there's 17 million pieces of mail in there stacked up to the rafters including things like Christmas packages that have rotted. You know, there's little rat eyes in the dark having snacks. So how is she going to solve this problem? Oh, and remember, previous units have tried and failed. She divides her soldiers up into shifts. They work 24 hours a day. She has 855 women in this, or in this organization from all over the US. Each shift processes 56,000 pieces of mail. So they're given how long to do this? Six months. They finish it in three. So what happens in the Army when you do well? You get more to do. So then they're sent to Rouen, France, where they process the same thing with all of the diplomatic mail. But as the war winds down, and after VE Day, soldiers start going home. Charity is offered a new position and a promotion. Now she goes from second lieutenant to lieutenant colonel in four years. Personally, I'm a little jealous of that. Um, <clears throat> but she's offered a job in the Pentagon and she said, I've been there, I got lost. I don't want to go there. So she leaves active duty and finishes her doctorate. Everyone else goes home. We, now we think about parades. There really was one big parade and that was in 1946 it was the 82nd Airborne Division, and they practiced six months to do that. So they had no recognition. Nobody remembers what they did. And it had been 20 years. It was 20 years before they started having reunions. <clears throat> so it's not until the 1990s that their stories start to come out about this unit and what it did. And this picture in the lower right is retired Master Sergeant Elizabeth Helms Frazier. And what, where Liz is is at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where they had just put up in 2018 a monument to the 6888. And what she is doing is saying, we stand on their shoulders. In 2019, the unit finally received a meritorious unit award. But then the campaign for a greater recognition started. Last year in February, I was pleased to be I was really privileged to be in the House of Representatives when they voted to pass the Congressional Gold Medal for this unit. It hasn't been presented yet. Well, you know, there's a few issues with supply chain, you know, getting it done. But there are six living veterans. So let's hope they get to see this medal soon. Now, there's going to be a movie about this um, if, you, if you read People magazine. I do, but I won't admit it. <laughs> <clears throat> Kerry Washington will play Charity Adams. Uh, Tyler Perry's been producing it. It should be on Netflix November, December. Oprah will play her in her later years. But there's also going to be a Broadway play. Um, Blair Underwood is producing this. I've seen uh, a rehearsal of one of the songs from it, and it's going to be great. I mean, you can make a Broadway musical from anything, I think. Although I still have this mental image of this being people in uniform dancing in a circle and flinging envelopes. So, <laughs> so and I think we'll see that next year. But I want to tell you just a little bit about a couple more people. 
because as I continued to work on this book, I was amazed, truly amazed by the number of people who had connections with each other. They knew of each other, or they'd been in the same place, maybe at a different time, and I am still finding these. So the person on the left is Kate Flynn Nolan. Now Kate joined the Army Nurse Corps right after graduating from nursing school in 1943, like most of her class. She wanted to make a contribution. I want to do my bit. I want to do my part. She wanted to be a flight nurse, so they sent her to McDill Army Air Station in Florida. Program is full. So she ends up in a combat hospital, heavy casualty. So I'm reading some of her story, <clears throat> and for most of these, you know, I find errors in them, and I want to I want to fix them and do right by these people. So I'm reading the story about, and then the nurses put up the tent. Well, this isn't our tents today where you take it out of the back of the SUV and push a button and it pops up. This takes all 18 of them pulling in different directions at the same time for it to actually go up. And they had to do this every eight to 10 days as they followed armor and infantry units from France through Luxembourg, through Belgium, into Germany throughout the rest of the war. They would put up the triage tent first, then surgery. Their job was to stabilize the patients before moving them to the rear. There were some occasions where they were shelled. They were mortared because they were too close to the front lines. And one of the things Kate said was, we would roll them out of their cots and lay on top of them until the firing stopped. So Kate married her husband, who she met while in, in Florida. He was sent to Japan, and part of their story was they didn't hear from each other for up to two years. Now, they had seven children, and any time I had a question, I talked to their oldest daughter, Mary Ann, who would have to convene with the others so that we could all discuss whatever the question was. <clears throat> so the publisher asked me, how did they meet up? How did these two meet up after the war? Mary Ann, I need to ask you how your parents met when they returned from the war. And she said, I will call the council. <laughs> I said, okay. Two weeks later, I haven't heard from her. I'm starting to worry. Oh, I wonder, wonder what they, they are deciding here. So finally she calls me and says, we have talked. None of us know. <laughs> Which is even more upsetting to them because she had just passed away. But she called me later and said, I want you to meet my sister-in-law, Carolyn. And I said, OK. So Carolyn calls me and says, I'm so happy to have the book. Um, Mary Ann gave it to me so I could read about her mother. But then I realized there was a story about Mary Previty. <coughs> now Mary Previty, Mary Taylor then, was a child in World War II. Her parents were missionaries in China. So she and her two brothers and sister went to an international school for Western children. When the Japanese invaded, they were taken prisoner. So this little girl spent five years of her childhood behind barbed wire. <clears throat> when she grew up, she became a high school teacher. Then later, was on the school board. Then later, in New Jersey, ran for the state senate, and then she also was the head of a juvenile detention center. The picture of her here is holding a piece of a parachute. After the victory over Japan in August of 1945, there was a great deal of worry that the Japanese would kill prisoners. So the OSS office in China dispatched teams to liberate the camps. So Mary, then 12, and all of the other teenage girls see these good-looking American paratroopers come in to liberate them, and they are entranced. <clears throat> so this piece of parachute, they all embroidered it and then gave it back to the paratroopers. While she was running this juvenile detention center, she decided one day in the mid-1990s to track down all of them as a pilgrimage to say thank you in person. And that's what Carolyn had wanted to tell me about. She said, because she was my neighbor in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Now, what are the chances? <clears throat> and she said, Mary was a force of nature. 
not just for everything else she did, but in her own neighborhood. So it was 1974, they were having a barbecue in her backyard. There may have been mimosas and Bloody Marys involved. And she said, what is wrong with our country? What's wrong with our country? We have no patriotism. This is at the time of the end of Vietnam. This is the time when Nixon had just resigned. And she said, we're going to have a parade. We're going to have a 4th of July parade. And Carolyn said, I remember as a kid, my mom and all the neighbors going to Mary's house and sewing that American flag. So it was carried in every 4th of July parade for the next 50 years. Now, Mary passed away in 2019, too. In 2020, there was no parade. But in Haddonfield, New Jersey, that flag went up in front of her house, and people would come just to touch it. So the next year, the parade came back. And you can see it takes 12 kids on either side to hold that thing up. But behind it, you can see what is also a really ugly float. <clears throat> it's a plane, or meant to be. And there were six neighbors who dressed up as paratroopers, and they told her story as they walked along. So we have legacy, and we have precedence, and we have times when we think we need more patriotism in this country, and then we find a way. So I want to thank you for listening to me talk about these people I know well, and I think of as my friends now. And if you want to ask me anything about any of them, I'm happy to talk about them, well, much longer than the library wants to be open. But, but thank you. Now she wants the microphone back, and I will actually go stand up there. But as you might imagine, at my height, podiums are not my friend. Anybody have one? Yes, ma'am. There must be a way to find, I mean, how did you find out about these people and what was your process? Well, part of my motivation was the fact that I'm starting to write this in January of 2020 and my deadline is May. So I was, uh, I was highly motivated, let's say, to put together as much as I could in this time. And some of the stories didn't work out. I couldn't find as much information as I would like. I couldn't find pictures. I talked to family members. I tracked down family members. Uh, some of the, this photo of Mary Previty was taken by the Philadelphia Inquirer. And so I tracked down the photographer to get that picture. So some of it was tracking down family members, some stories, their own writings, and then whatever I could get from museums that would open their doors to me or go in and look. So even after I published this book, I continued to find more that I wished I'd had earlier. And so my publisher said, do you have a newsletter? Why don't you make a newsletter? So it lets me continue to tell some of their stories that I continue to find. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, ever since this book came out, I continue to meet people who knew them, who were friends with them. I was at the uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans last year and signing books, and this guy walked up to me and said, yeah, Stephanie Chuck, she was my neighbor. And then he walked away, and I'm going, come back. <laughs> so I finally got to talk to him and got some more stories about her and some of the things she did that were just amazing. I was just going to say, uh, did you know uh, Colonel Helen McCormick? No. Oh, she, was, she set up field hospitals in Europe uh, in World War II and also Korea and I think maybe even served in Vietnam and uh, she just died in 2020 and uh, a funny story that she liked to tell was um, that uh, one time uh, they thought they were going to be bombed <coughs> by the Germans because the planes were coming in and they landed and it was uh, at the end of the war so uh, the, the pilots all surrendered to the Americans and they surrendered to her because she was a colonel Good for her. <laughs> there were 56,000 nurses who served in World War II. So I think that we're going to see uh, the Army Nurse Corps recognize all of the ones who were in Kate's unit, hopefully this year. Or Sigma will. Sigma is the nursing sorority. 
Anybody else? Well, my story is not interesting, but <laughs> so you know, I came in the army thinking, like many of these people did, this I can I can get a start this way. Um, I'm not going to stay. I'm just going to you know get some experience and then go on from there. Um, I found that I had some incredible opportunities. I lived in in Germany for eight years. I taught at the Marshall Center there, which teaches the principles of democratic governance to the former Soviet republics, which was an incredible experience. And I learned so much about all of these countries there, although my, my language skills are limited. And I was always afraid I would create an international incident. Uh, whether intentionally or accidentally, I wasn't sure. But I had a marvelous time doing that. I love doing public affairs. Uh, writing, so I've always written, but not, never anything this large. And so I had a great time doing that. I was able to continue. I was probably the most surprised person that they promoted me to general, although certainly many people told me they were equally as surprised when that happened. <laughs> Thirty-six. I still won't use an umbrella, you know. I mean, there's things that stay with you from it that, <clears throat> and then you criticize every movie you see, which I can't help. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but according to the internet, um, you enlisted when the WAC was still active before they were disbanded. Looking at what the training programs were like during World War II, there was a lot of focus on what um, the esprit de corps, the WAC, was in the history of the corps, even though at that point, you know, they were maybe only months in. Did you have that? Did they talk about the history of the WAC in the inception from 42 on? Or was it just kind of like, we're in this new modern 1970s army um, that was kind of glossed over? So I guess the, the long question is, um, <laughs> How new was the WAC information as you were working on this book to you? Or did you have, because of your career, a solid understanding of like Charity Adams early and Stephanie Check's background? I knew nothing about them. Um, I'll tell you that when I came into the Army, it was just like nine months before the WAC was disestablished. So you got a book of its history, but it was like a textbook. So there was very little in it that was interesting. Don't tell them I said that. It, it wasn't green, it was tan. Um, so I'm not even sure that at that time I understood what it all meant, other than I had to wear the Palace Athena and then at the end you were given a real branch. So I was branched military police, which was fine with me. I didn't want to be in the Signal Corps because all of the people I knew in the Signal Corps had degrees in electrical engineering and that was over my head. So, you know, I didn't even learn much about it for many years. It's, there, is, there are Army historical books on World War II and on every phase of history, but they're, they're very limited. And there is a chapter in there on this 6888 which is not very complimentary and it is not very thorough. So those are a starting point. They're not um, an authority, let's say. And on that happy note, <laughs> anything else? Yes, ma'am. How many female generals are there? What's today's army like for women? When I left active duty in 2013, I think there were seven. And I was the only army major general on active duty at that time from the reserve component. <clears throat> there are 41 generals at the, at the four-star level in the Army, and now there are quite a few of them. I think it's something like 8% of the Army. Now, the Army is 1.2 million people, so <clears throat> the number of people who make 
kernel is less than 10 percent. The, num the number who make general is less than 1 percent. So it's a, it's a tightrope. You're, you're good. You can do it. Just don't look down. That's how I look at it. Today's Army has volume. There are more women coming in. The Army is more sophisticated and more technical and more cyber-oriented and drones and all of those things. And <clears throat> all of the jobs are now open to women, but only as of 2017. So there is still a lot of change. There's still adaptation. And you would think by this time we would be past the point of saying, oh, look, there's a first. Oh, look, there's a trailblazer. But trailblazers get forgotten, trails get grown over, and sometimes we start again. But I have absolute faith in where this Army is going, without me. <laughs> yes, please. What's your next project? <clears throat> Are you working on a new book? Um, well, I try to give myself two weeks off, you know, in between them. But the, the publisher has a definite schedule, so I think the next one that I will promote to them in this series will be about women in sports, and it will be called The, the Girls Who Beat the Odds. Now, I hope none of you are upset about the term girls, because I get that question, oh, why, do they, why do they call it girls? Well, you know, there's the boys in the boat and the boys from Brazil, so we have boys and girls, and it's just a trend in publishing. So, so that is the next one in that series. There's also the fiction that my publisher is pushing now, which are thrillers, which is what I wanted to write. And what I wrote first, but I wasn't very good at it, and I'm getting better, so. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your book that just came out? <clears throat> the one that just came out? Well, one of my friends who lives in Florida said to me, well, your first book was nice and all that, but you need to write about my grandmother, who was a cop in New York City starting in 1915. And I said, what? Which I had never thought about. And so she gave me some, some news articles about her, her grandmother, and I was absolutely hooked on it. She did everything from go undercover in the Nazi movement in the 1930s to manage all of the witnesses in mob trials. She was bait for a serial killer. And there were hundreds of them in New York, but we don't hear about their stories. The NYPD has no historian. They destroyed all of their files before 1930. So there's, there's not much, many ways to find these stories going back that far, other than the newspapers of the day, which, well, let's just say some of them weren't very factual, and that's being nice. But they were fun. I mean, they had memes then that were really crazy. And everybody had really bad nicknames, too. Any other questions for this evening? Well, thank you all so much thank for you. joining us. Um, the Learned Owl is here tonight, and they have both of her books available for purchase. They've moved their table out into the rotunda. You can purchase your copies out there, or if you'd like to have your book signed or just talk with General Eater, you can do that out in our rotunda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.